Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're dipping back into the practically overflowing well of strange designs and concepts that was Blom and Voss. As we've talked about in several videos here, Blom and Voss, and for the most part Richard Vogt of Blom and Voss, would design a variety of bizarre and boundary-pushing designs, from their iconic asymmetric recon plane, the BV-141, to their tri-engine pod racer that was the P-170, to their oblique wing jet fighter, the P-202. These are just three designs from an absolute goldmine of bizarre ideas, and today's topic is absolutely no different, with a design that reminds me both of a hammerhead shark and the sidecar of a motorcycle, probably closer to the hammerhead, as it kind of had the eyes spread apart in some way. This is the Blom and Voss P-163. For when the story of the P-163 starts, we have two options. On one hand, the P-163 would come about from a design request from the Reich Ministry of Aviation for a new design that would replace the HE-111 medium bomber. On the other hand, for the other option, it is also possible that the 163 came about from Blom and Voss and Vogt, continuing research into asymmetric designs, making the 163 and then submitting it to the Reich Air Ministry unprovoked and unrequested. Regardless of why the design happened, the result is the same nonetheless. In early 1942, when the design was submitted, the war situation was changing for Germany. After the massive offensive that was Operation Barbarossa started to ground to a halt in the Russian winter, short of its goals of destroying the Soviets outright, it was slowly becoming clear that the war against the Soviets may be a war of attrition. Because of this, vital resources of all kinds would be incredibly valuable, and conservation of these resources would be welcome. One of these resources was aluminum a relatively strong metal that was incredibly lightweight compared to other metals. Aluminum was a great metal to increase strength and durability without dramatically increasing weight. The problem was that it simply wasn't as abundant or available as heavier metals like steel. So when Blom and Voss designed the 163, in mind was resource conservation along with their ideas regarding asymmetry. The bulk of the design would be made of steel, both steel tubing for the frame and steel plating for the skin and armor. The control surfaces would be wooden, though, instead of steel or aluminum, and the same could be said for the tail section in general. Measuring in at 15.15 meters long, 20.73 meters wide, and 3.6 meters tall, the main fuselage of the 163 would be remarkably barren. Located inside the fuselage would be a pair of engines driving a single contra-rotating propeller system. Blom and Voss would present two different 163 designs that differed only in their engines. In their first model, there would be a pair of inline DB603 engines running in unison this technically being the DB613 variant, with a total horsepower around 3,800. On the second model, the engines would be two radial BMW 801 engines, also coupled as a single unit, this known as the BMW 803, this too with around 3,800 horsepower. The key difference between the two was weight, with the BMW 803 weighing 6,490 pounds dry, and the DB613 weighing 3,968 pounds dry. The more interesting and obvious aspect of the 163 design, though, was the cockpit and defensive pod. Instead of having the crew in the fuselage like a normal and sane person would, the 163 would have these two pods, one on each wingtip. In each of these pods would be two crew members. In one of them, typically depicted on the port or left side, would be the main cockpit. The pilot would sit behind a multitude of glass panels to his front, 
side and below. Being that this was designed to be a bomber, this would ideally give him excellent vision all around and below, not being obscured to his direct front by the propeller and below him by the rest of the fuselage, landing gear, and bomb bay. Behind him would sit a defensive gunner slash bombardier. Directly behind the pilot was the necessary equipment to aim and drop bombs, and behind that was a defensive machine gun turret that consisted of two MG-15120 cannons with 500 rounds of ammunition, possibly 500 rounds per gun. On the starboard or right side is typically depicted a purely defensive pod with two more crew members, a front gunner and a rear gunner. On this side would be the only forward-facing armament in the form of two separate MG-15120 cannons. One would be mounted directly on the tip of the pod that would largely be used for firing forward or downward in ground attacking roles, and that would be operated by one of the two crew members. The other forward gun would be a turret with a glass dome top that was used for firing forward or upward. Then on the rear of the pod would be another twin MG-15120 turret. The rear turret too would have 500 or 1000 rounds, and the two forward guns would have between 250 and 500 rounds apiece. The final piece of the armament would be the under fuselage semi-recessed bomb bay that could hold upwards of 5,500 pounds of explosives. If there wasn't enough room in the bay, bombs could be held under wing. With this overall design concept, there was a rather clear problem that needed solving. Because of the pods on the wingtips weighing quite a lot with all of the equipment, weaponry, and people, there would be a lot of excess weight on the wings. This naturally would mean that structurally reinforcing the wing spars and roots would be the logical necessity. If they didn't, there could be issues with the wings drooping under the intense weight and causing internal structural damage that could lead to the overall destruction of the wings. However, this internal reinforcement that would be more steel would lead to increases in weight, which would mean decreases in overall performance. To put it simply, Blom and Voss needed to find the right balance of reinforcement and weight saving. But according to the Blom and Voss design proposal, they wouldn't actually have to do that, as far as I understand their reasoning. While in a vacuum, the excess weight at the tips, Blom and Voss estimated a ton of weight per pod that would make the wings droop and damage things. In flight, Blom and Voss predicted something else. What they theorized was that the upward force that the air pressure would place on the wings would be naturally counterbalanced by the weight on the wingtips, thus balancing things out. On a normal wing, the wing roots generally need to be more reinforced because of the upward force on the wings, placing stress on where the wings meet the fuselage. But if there was a counterbalancing weight on the tips, that downward force would equalize with the upward force. This would ideally mean that there wouldn't need to be any extra reinforcement in the wings or wing roots, thus helping keep the weight down. With this proposed theory, this would help the mostly steel 163 sit at an empty weight just over 20,000 pounds, a weight on par with the HE 111 that it may have been designed to replace. Its gross weight, though, would shoot up over 50% to over 33,000 pounds. This was a combination of the armament, both cannon ammo and bomb load, and the proposed fuel capacity that was likely around 1,000 gallons. Keep in mind that the fuselage was basically all free space now, so that would help with the fuel capacity. The range of the 163 would, well, range from 1,200 to 1,600 miles, depending on the altitude. Additionally, the top speed at an altitude of 20,000 feet would sit between 320 and 354 miles an hour, a relatively solid top speed, all things considered. Additional selling points for this radical design would be modability and field of view. 
while the 163 is typically depicted as having the cockpit on the port side, the cockpit could be easily placed on the starboard side with no real difference. Conceptually as well, the defensive pod could be replaced with something else if needed, like a one-ton extra fuel tank, for example, for longer-range missions. Then for the field of view aspect, apart from the pilot's FOV, the FOV of the defensive gunners was rather wide, and could even intersect for increased firepower. If there was an enemy plane directly on their tail, both of the pod gunners could focus their twin cannons on target, for an absolutely devastating attack. Further adding to the 163 sales pitch was the fact that Blom and Voss would modify one of their BV-141s to have a cockpit on the wingtip. And at least according to them, this test fielded excellent results that showed that the pilot would be able to sufficiently control the plane. No photographs of this modified plane seem to exist, though. But if I take this picture of the 163 and chop this part off, that's basically what it looked like. Unfortunately for Blom and Voss, their testing and design work led to literally nothing as the Air Ministry either rejected it or just flat out ignored their design proposal, which isn't all that surprising considering the bizarre nature of it. I think if they did throw Blom and Voss a bit of a bone there and the plane advanced as far as the prototype stage, I think the whole theory of the wing weight balancing out the upward forces probably would have been ignored in some sense, simply out of caution. I think they would have just bit the bullet and added in some more reinforcement, it would just make things less complicated. And as we all know, the Germans love to keep things as simple as possible, which is a horribly untrue statement. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Something kind of related to the offset cockpit design, at least to me anyway. I often have these dreams where I'm driving, but for some reason I'm driving from the back seat of my car. Like, behind the front seat, and I can't see. But for whatever reason, I can drive just fine. I guess that's just dream logic. It doesn't exactly have to make sense. You're just along for the ride in your dreams. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!